Hello and welcome back to A Fall From Grace. So, because I recorded the first part a while ago and I'm recording this part shortly after it was released, I don't really remember what happened in the first part. <laughs> Actually, I kind of do. I remember that the main character, whose name I'm forgetting right now, was like a spoiled kid. He was from a rich family, but the family or at least the father wasn't very supportive, I guess. And he was friends with the, um, with one of the staff, uh, as a kid or as a young adult, I guess, or as a teenager. I don't, I actually didn't really place what age they were at the time, but, um, they were friends and the father didn't like that. He told them not to be associating with him. And then I think eventually they kicked the family out and they fell on hard times. And he kind of blamed the, the kid for it, or, or at least the family. And eventually the spoiled kid was kicked out too because, well, you know, sometimes spoiled kids spend a lot of money without really thinking or without really thinking of their future. And he ended up moving in with like a, another rich friend, a lion. I think it's Lysander or Lysander. I think I was pronouncing it Lysander, but it's probably Lysander. And he wasn't a very good influence, and that just got the guy cut off entirely from his family. So he was basically dependent on the lion's family's, or the lion's grandmother's, um, for like room and board. And he was basically dissatisfied with his life as a whole. And eventually one day he is, well, they are, after like spending a night uh, drinking, they come out of, a, of a, a bar, a pub, and they're uh, mugged by, um, I think it's this guy. I, I don't remember if it's this guy or someone else who turns out to be the, uh, the childhood friend who basically had to go into a life of crime in order to sustain his family and then himself after his family disowned him for, you know, basically having to go into a life of crime, even though he was helping the family. But yeah. And it started off a little bit awkward, and then him saying like, you know, dude, I resented you, you know, and blah blah blah. But it's like, oh, well, I guess I'm kind of happy that you're back. And then the guy going like, hey, I'm dissatisfied with my family, or with my life. How about I join you, my friend? And the guy was oddly like, I guess? I mean, sure, why not? You know, you were always a good friend or you're a friend that I like there was some tension there obviously <laughs> uh, oh and the main character basically came out to the line when they were having a fight like when the line caught him like leaving the house and then the lines are like oh, why, why are you leaving with this bandit dude and stuff and he's like no you should be staying with me even though I just said some I think it was like homophobic stuff but then like basically saying like no I want you to stay with me I'll give you the life you deserve you stupid person but yeah and after he found out that he left or after he left he's like no you're not gonna get to leave and that guy is you know not gonna get to take you or you know be with you or whatever but yeah I guess that's kind of the whole plot of what's gonna happen the lion's going to be after them, trying to ruin their life, or eventually probably will ruin something. So yeah, anyways, um, so I guess that's me getting you caught up, even though you're probably going to see this like a day or a, a day or two after the first, you know, part goes up. But yeah, anyways, so without further ado, let us continue A Fall From Grace. The two friends set off early the next morning after a few hours sleep. The sun shone brightly in the sky while the pleasant breeze rustled the leaves of the bushes and trees nearby. Cedric's back was already hurting slightly. Not sleeping in his own bed was a part of his new lifestyle he still had to get used to. He was walking beside Victor, who was already whistling as he marched on cheerfully. They weren't too far from their old home yet, as Cedric recognized the road that they were on. 
In a few more hours, they could reach unfamiliar territory, which was a thought that both excited and slightly terrified the coyote. This path was often used by merchants and travelers, heading from one town to the next. It had trees on either side and couldn't fit more than one carriage at a time. Thus, he imagined that it would be perfect for someone like Victor to stage a robbery. The remains of an old fence stood to the path's left. Almost overrun by the surrounding overgrowth, it gave this particular spot a rather picturesque feel, the coyote thought to himself. In fact, it was as if a gallant knight from an old novel could show up at any moment, riding his noble steed on the way to save his beloved from the clutches of an evil wizard. A sudden feeling of sadness filled Cedric as he realized that Victor had missed out on many of those old books the coyote had enjoyed so much during his teenage years. He still had a lot to tell him about. Did you sleep well, Cedric? Victor had stopped whistling after noticing his friend seemingly wrapped up in thought. This really was the same old Cedric the fox remembered. The coyote had always made a habit of losing himself in his own thoughts, sometimes even during a conversation. This tended to occur pretty regularly the last time, having been only a few days before his meal at the tavern with Lysander, Jack, and Bill. Oh, yes. I'm still adjusting to all of this, if you get what I mean. Victor chuckled softly, looking somewhat relieved. Of course. The fox's expression turned pensive again as they walked on. I hope I haven't convinced you to do something foolish. What do you mean? Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I absolutely adore having you here by my side. It's just, this is going to be a big change in your life. And there's no going back now. I just hope that you don't come to regret this sort of choice, that's all. You don't just leave your life behind and you become a bandit on any old day, you know. Don't worry, V. I, I made my mind up. If anything does go wrong, it's not your fault at all. I was the one who decided to come with you. I trust you like no one else. You're a brave man, Cedric. Cedric smiled as he looked the other way. I'm not. Come, come. Have some pride and accept this compliment. It takes a lot of guts to do what you did yesterday. I don't think that I've ever met someone quite like you. I must confess, I admire you very much indeed. Cedric did his best to stop himself from blushing. Stop, stop. I'm not worthy of these remarks. Victor noticed his friend was beginning to look slightly flustered and thought it best to change the subject. I hope you're ready for more walking today. We still have a long way to go. You know, I don't mind a good stroll. This is more than just a stroll, I'm afraid. Don't worry. I'll be fine, I promise. The fox smiled playfully. Are you sure those posh legs of yours can resist more than one day's journeying? You better watch your tongue, peasant, or you'll be carrying me on your shoulders soon. About half an hour later, they reached an unusual narrow point in the path, where the trees seemed to close in tightly as everything grew more shady and mysterious. You know, it's been on my mind ever since we started walking this path. This would be a perfect spot for a robbery, wouldn't it? Victor smiled as he turned to look at his friend, placing a hand on his shoulder and pulling him in his direction. Well noticed, my dear. I see you already have a keen eye for a highwayman. Cedric laughed. Hey, let go, you rascal. After a short struggle, Cedric succeeded in brushing off his friend's hand from his shoulder, but groaned as it began to slide down to his waist. You won't be getting rid of me that easily. The two of them came to a halt and observed their surroundings as Victor eventually let go of the coyote. Have you ever mugged someone here, V? This spot? Not as far as I can remember. We're still too far from town but it would take me a whole while to get back here on foot. Perhaps if I stole a horse from my victims, the plan could work. Ah, yes. I hadn't thought about that. Just one of the many things you have to consider in this trade. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I could tell you about a few of my best robberies instead. If you're interested, that is. Of course I'm interested. We've still got so much to say to each other. Victor gestured at a fallen tree trunk nearby, and they both sat down. The fox pulled out a small flask, and after downing some of its contents, he began to narrate a few of his adventures as Cedric listened in awe. 
Despite his jokes a few minutes earlier, he had been genuinely concerned about his friend tiring out quickly, and thought these stories would be a good way for them to have a quick break. Hmm, where to start? Ah, I know just the tale. About a year ago, these two noblemen decided to have a duel over some petty argument, as rich idiots always do. It so happened that they chose a particularly abandoned building as a location of their fight. You mean... Indeed, the bastards picked my hideout. I witnessed the whole thing as I snuck about, quietly blocking every exit in the building. One of them, I think his name was Edward, wounded the other quite badly. Whether this was by accident or not, I couldn't tell. But once he stood up after checking on his competitor, there I was, standing behind him. To make things even better, they were both carrying extremely valuable rings and pocket watches. Of course that sort wouldn't dare part from their precious objects, even while battering each other. Just goes to show what their priorities are. But from my job's point of view, it made no difference. And what a lucky day that was. That's incredible. But what about the wounded fellow? Did he make it out all right? I'm afraid not. His wounds was deep and he died a short time later. I don't even remember where I dumped the body. Cedric looked a bit uneasy after that last detail. A bandit's life isn't all fun and games, Cedric. I'm afraid that you'll have to get used to that. Switching off his serious tone, Victor continued more merrily. I'll tell you one more story. This is an especially interesting one. It had been a very unlucky week. I really wasn't doing too well. I was tired and had no money left. Every person that I tried mugging had almost nothing on them, and I only narrowly escaped the guards a few other times. Then one evening, I did something risky and mugged an old badger, a member of the town council by the way, just outside of his own front door. He just returned from a gambling house and was absolutely loaded with gold. So much gold that I decided that I would treat myself. I traveled to another town and actually bought this mask, a completely honest purchase. I added some of the decorations myself, even though my artistic abilities are notably beneath yours. Cedric rolled his eyes at that last remark. Come on, I haven't drawn anything in at least two years now. But getting back to your tale, I was wondering, what did you use uh, before the mask? Just a few rags to cover my muzzle. The mask is so much easier to wear and breathe in, and it didn't even cost me that much. Oh, but speaking of money, we need to be very smart with what we have right now. I only got a few coins on me and I'm not sure that you don't have much either. Good thinking, my boy. However, in this case we are quite lucky, as I have this by my side. The fox gestured at the sack that he'd been carrying along with him since they set off. Cedric had guessed it only contained food and perhaps another pair of clothes, but was now excited as his mind started racing at the thought of what kind of riches this humble sack could be hiding. What is in there? What did you get? Whoa, 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 easy there. I'll show you in due time. For now, rest assured that we can get by with what we have for a few days at least, and sell some of it later on. Victor, I also have something for you. I'm sorry I meant to give it to you yesterday, but I forgot after everything that happened. Oh? What is it? I just need to find it. Cedric slightly mumbled that to himself as he rummaged around in his jacket pockets, pulling out a small white object and placing it in Victor's open hands. His friend's eyes lit up as he gazed at this object, realizing what he had been given. Cedric, you shouldn't have. I wanted to give this to you as a memento of all those wonderful days that we spent together. Victor was holding a small white knight chess piece, Still shiny and intricately ornate, he kept silent for a few seconds then leant forward, hugging the coyote. It feels wonderful having you back here with me. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Cedric couldn't think of anything worth saying, and just sat there hugging his friend with the biggest grin on his face. Then Victor let go and the two slowly got up from where they were sitting. I took that from Lysander's aunt's house, by the way. It will drive him up the wall when he discovers that piece is missing. You have no idea how much he spent on that chess set. Funnier still, he doesn't even like chess. The fox seemed to ignore Cedric's last comment as he gazed at the path in front of them. Uh, Victor? Then his ears shut up suddenly. 
V? Someone's coming. We need to hide. Now! He shoved Cedric and the two quickly got off the path and hid amongst the green bushes and undergrowth. Then Cedric heard it as well. Marching footsteps. It sounded like a small group of about four or five people. They seemed to be quite well coordinated in their marching, and that could only mean one thing. Guards. Shh! Victor claps his hands over Cedric's muzzle as the crew finally came into view, reaching the spot where the two friends had been standing just a few minutes earlier. Cedric gazed at their red uniforms from his hiding spot as they passed by. They seemed to be common guards patrolling the roads from town to town. Most of them weren't too young and their uniforms were well worn. The color slightly faded after hours likely spent under the sun. They were equipped with some old rifles and a dagger each. However, there was something oddly familiar about them. Cedric thought that he recognized their leader, adorned with a plumed helmet of some sort, but who was otherwise dressed identically to the other three. After a few seconds, he almost kicked himself as he realized this was one of the soldiers he had spoken to when inquiring about Victor a few days earlier. How could he have done something so foolish? Now these guards were searching for both of them and knew exactly who Cedric was. The coyote's head dropped as he felt responsible for the mess that they were in, now more than ever. The guards soon passed out of sight and the sound of their footsteps began to fade in the distance. Victor broke the silence, turning to face the coyote. He was trying his best to hide a decidedly worried look. Strange to see these guards here at this time of the day. Perhaps they've been alerted to something. What do you think? Cedric tried to think of something to say, but all that he was able to do was sit there in silence. Whatever was the cause, all of the more reason for us to hurry up and leave this place once and for all. The fox began to speak louder as they stood up and made their way back to the path. We need to be very careful from now on. I'd rather we slept somewhere safer tonight. We can't afford any big mistakes. Cedric wasn't quite sure what kind of place Victor was referring to, but seeing as the fox didn't quite elaborate, he thought that he wouldn't bother him with more questions for the time being. The two began walking again, Cedric silently following Victor down the overgrown path. A few hours had passed and the sun was beginning to set, everything turning a soft shade of orange. The two friends had been walking for what's beginning to seem like forever, and it was starting to show. Their pace had gradually slowed down, and they were starting to grow hungry. Victor imagined Cedric wouldn't be able to walk much longer and had begun looking around searching for something in the peaceful evening landscape. Cedric had kept silence since they'd set off after hiding from the guards. The fox hadn't thought much about this at first, but now that he was beginning to wonder, was he just fatigued after a long day's walk? Or had the incident a few hours back had a deeper effect than he'd anticipated? The coyote, seemingly noticing his friend's gaze, suddenly broke the silence. Look, V. There's something that you should know. What's the matter? I noticed that you've been very quiet since we set off again. Cedric gathered his courage as he gazed at the path beneath him. I made this whole situation worse. I'm sorry. Victor came to a halt. He had not been expecting this at all. He let out a slightly confused laugh as he tried to picture the best reply to give in the situation. Uh, what? Come on, Cedric. No need to beat yourself up like this. I mean it. When I was searching for you a few days ago, I spoke to the leader of those guards. Victor didn't say anything, waiting for Cedric to finish his train of thought. I asked if they knew anything about you, and now they're out here searching for the both of us, and they know damn well who I am. I'm such an idiot. Victor smiled. Cedric, it's all right. I told them about the mugging, described your appearance and everything. They were rather puzzled as to why I was searching for you. But luckily for the both our sakes, I didn't elaborate on the detail. That's the long and short of it. I'm sorry. It's fine, seriously. I can't say that it was a smart thing to do. But they would have been looking for us anyway, what with you disappearing and such. This just means that they have a better lead than I had anticipated. Cedric was relieved to hear how well his friend had taken his confession of sorts, even though he still couldn't entirely shake off the feeling of guilt that he'd been carrying that afternoon. However, you shouldn't worry about yourself. You're known as an honest lad, 
they'd never suspect you to have run off with a criminal in their wildest dreams. The fox chuckled. It's more likely that they'd imagine you'd been kidnapped by the very bandit that you'd been searching for. Now that would make for a good story. Regardless of what they think, we're both in this mess together, which means that we'll just have to deal with whatever comes our way. Yes, you're right. Thanks for understanding. Victor suddenly shoved the coyote, almost making him topple over. Hey! Cedric turned to his friend with a bewildered look on his face, only to see the fox sporting an amused grin. And that is for telling the guards! The two burst out laughing, and Victor soon began to playfully chase Cedric just like the two used to when they were kids. The old memories unlocked by games such as this were almost overwhelming. Then the fox's eyes lit up as he gazed toward the horizon. There's one at last. There's what? Cedric looked up as he tried to see what Victor was pointing at. A farmstead. I've been on the lookout for one for a while now. The coyote gazed at where Victor was pointing. It was a small, lonely building surrounded by the dimly lit fields. As a cozy and lived-in look to it, the neatly kept vegetable patch displaying the care the owners had for this little farm. Cedric couldn't see any animals, only the distant sounds of clucking reached his ears as he concluded these owners probably kept their chickens and geese around the other side of the building. To the left stood a barn made entirely out of wood, the hatched roof being the only exception matching that of the main building. The two followed the path and quickly reached the old front gate. Cedric kept walking, but soon halted once he noticed Victor was standing at the gate. We can ask to sleep here for the night. Perhaps they'd even offer us something to eat? Cedric seemed hesitant. What makes you think that they'd let us in? Aren't we supposed to be hiding anyway? Usually I'd say you're right, but today's different because I can count on you. Thanks to your clothes and demeanor, the two of us will look much more respectable and will pass as some simple travelers. They'll surely let us in. The fox began walking towards the building and Cedric followed at a distance, still slightly nervous. Come on, Cedric. We'll be perfectly safe. The coyote caught up with Victor and they reached the main door at the same time. Cedric lifted his arm and knocked a few times. How's your arm, by the way? Is it better? Much better, thanks. I'll probably be as good as new tomorrow. The sound of footsteps approaching the door became audible as the two quickly began brushing some dirt off their clothes. Victor running a hand through his hair and Cedric laying the sack with his clothing on the ground beside him. The door swung open and the two were greeted by the friendly figure of the farmer and a warm light emanating from a fireplace in the room behind him. He was a goat in his mid-fifties by the looks of it, rather muscular and with an unsurprisingly long beard. He was dressed in a simple, ragged clothing and was smoking an old-looking pipe. He gazed at the two and then smiled gently. Good evening, young sirs. How can I help you? Victor spoke up before Cedric could say anything. Good evening to you, my good man. We have been traveling all day and are looking for a place where we can rest for the night. Oh? Where are you heading to? Eastward, to the larger towns. We will be visiting a cousin of mine. Cedric said this hoping that it would add to their credibility. He saw Victor nod, which was encouraging. At least he got something right this time. The farmer turned his head to look at the coyote. My my, you're well dressed, my good fellow. I'd expect someone of your status to be traveling by carriage or the like. This put Cedric on the spot. He hadn't thought about that detail. Oh, um... Why, yes, of course. It's just that we have been delayed somewhat. Victor jumped in before Cedric was able to say anything. This is a bit embarrassing, but our carriage was attacked by a group of bandits. We made a run for it and have had to continue our journey on foot. Really now? Agnes, come hear this. These young men were attacked by some bandits earlier. The two heard a voice reply from what must have been the kitchen, along with the sounds of approaching footsteps. Bandits? Oh, for heaven's sake. I thought they would have finally left. The farmer's wife soon came into view. She was a collie, only slightly shorter than him, with fairly broad shoulders and a cheerful but matter-of-fact look about her. She was wearing a large apron and had obviously been cooking as the others had been speaking. Good evening, boys. She shook both their hands energetically. 
You don't mind if I call you that, do you? Cedric smiled. Not at all, ma'am. Call me Agnes. And my name's Harold. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Cedric was about to introduce himself when he noticed Victor turn and give him a serious look. Almost reading his friend's minds, he reasoned that perhaps it's best not to use their actual names when there are guards searching for you up and down the whole country parish. After a second's pause, he spoke. My name is Alistair, and this is my friend... Uh, Dorian. Cedric glanced back at his friend, who was now sporting a satisfied grin. Well, now that the formalities are out of the way, how about you join us for dinner? Of course, do come in and make yourselves comfortable. And with that, the farmer walked back into the building, with Cedric and Victor both following suit. After passing the small entrance, they set foot in what was obviously the main room of the house. A wide old table was at the center, with a large fireplace to their left and a steamed-up windows to their right. A slightly crooked door was also visible and must have led into the kitchen, judging by the pleasant smell emanating from the room beyond it. Harold gestured at a couple of chairs lining the old table. Sit down and make yourselves at home. I'll fetch us something to drink. And with that, both him and Agnes disappeared into the kitchen. Cedric and Victor sat down next to each other on the surprisingly comfy chairs. There was nothing on the table except the old lit candles, which gave the place an almost medieval look. As Cedric looked into the picturesque surroundings, he heard his friend whisper, Good job, my boy. He turned to look at Victor. The fox's face was half-lit quite dramatically by the candlelight, almost resembling a Baroque painting. Cedric thought that he'd never seen someone so beautiful. Hey, pretty boy, are you there? Victor gave a little laugh as he saw his friend looking at him with a, such intensity. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. The coyote blushed a little as he stared nervously tapping his fingers on the wooden surface. Harold soon reappeared holding a couple of mugs. Here you go, lads. I hope it's to your liking. I brew the cider myself. The two thanked him as they tasted their drinks. Cedric's eyes widened as he put down his mug after taking a sip. It's delicious. Thank you, thank you. Harold put his elbow on the table, leaning in a little with his fingers crossed. I'm sorry about what happened to you two. We used to have this whole heaps of trouble with bandits round here, what with the roads being as narrow as they are. In fact, there used to be talks of an entire gang hiding in the forest. Really? Cedric could tell that Victor was rather amused by this, but was doing his best to hide it. The goat shook his head. Oh, it used to be awful. Come to think of it, I did hear about these bandits myself a while back. Didn't they attack a wealthy lord somewhere nearby about a year ago? Yes, yes indeed. Twas the nobleman and the politician Lord Sanderson, as he was riding alone. Used to be a very foolish thing to do round here, might I add. Stripped him of all his riches they did, and damn near cut his hands off. Why, those wretches even took his clothes. He was sent back to town in rags. Good heavens! Victor was obviously enjoying himself, leading Cedric to wonder if perhaps one of the bandits the farmer had been speaking ill of was none other than the fox. But it has been a while since I've heard about someone's carriage being attacked, so we had assumed all the local rogues had left for some reason or another. But now that I think about it, Agnes told me that she saw a group of guards passing by this morning. Might that be connected to the thieves that you encountered? Ah, yes. We weren't far from town, and they caught word of the attack shortly after. But between you and me, they were of no help whatsoever. Harold laughed. I can't say that I don't share that sentiment, my boy. He sat back in his chair as he drank more of the cider. We were lucky to have found this place, and we're very grateful for your hospitality. If we can repay you in any way... Nonsense. I'm sure that you lost enough to those scums as it is. We're very happy to have you as our guests, and you can sleep in the barn too, if you like. That would be perfect. Thank you so much, sir. The goat laughed heartily at this reply. Harold, please. I'm hardly a sir. After a few minutes, Agnes reappeared holding some plates filled with steaming hot chicken, along with corn, beans, and a few other vegetables. Here you go, boys. I hope this food is to your liking. 
I'll help you with the other plates, my dear. The goat got up and walked back into the kitchen. Thank you, darling. They're all on the right with the cutlery. Don't break anything this time. Harold replied jokingly. When have I ever broken something? A few moments later, the four of them were all sitting at the table enjoying their meal. The food was simple, but absolutely delicious, and it wasn't long before both Cedric and Victor had almost licked their plates clean. So, how did the two of you meet, if you don't mind me asking? Not at all, not at all. I have always lived close by, and Agnes here comes from a town neighboring mine, so we'd often see each other on markets, fairs, and, and the like. I'd always used to think that he was the sweetest fellow that I'd ever set eyes on. Harold chuckled a little. So after a few years, we spoke of getting married. I waited longer than all my friends, something that they'd often take jabs at me about. I just wanted to be sure. There's no point in spending the rest of your life with someone that you don't care for. My parents didn't think much of him at first, and that's an understatement. It didn't take long for his charm to win them over, though. As for my parents, well, they were both dead by then, which meant that I'd gotten used to living alone and being self-sufficient. And do you two still love each other? Very much so. I always poke fun at Harry, but the truth is that I adore him just as much as I did 15 years ago. Likewise, my darling. The warm look the two gave each other was so full of love. Cedric almost felt his heart melt. He thought such people could only exist in fairy tales, yet here they were, sitting right in front of him. He wished that he too could live in such a picturesque location with a person he deeply cared for, Sunday. Whilst thinking of the setting, an image of Victor's face came to him almost automatically, and soon Cedric found that this thought couldn't escape his mind. Not that he minded that, in all honesty. The chances of something like that ever happening were very slim, and he knew that. It was still good to let your imagination run wild ever so often, he thought. How about you lads? You're still young, of course, but is there anyone you fancy? I bet both you lovely gents have your eyes on some pretty bow from your hometown. Cedric suddenly felt a wave of anxiety hit him as he tried to think of how to answer that. He turned to face Victor, but the fox was evidently waiting for him to speak first. After a few incredibly long seconds, he replied rather quietly. Oh, that's a complicated subject. I'm sure I have fancied some people, but... I don't think it's ever been something serious. Don't I know it? You still have your whole life ahead of you, my boy. No point rushing into these things. Take it from me. And your being the heir of a wealthy family means most of the girls in town will have to set their eyes on you, so you have ample choice when the time comes. Cedric smiled with relief, having managed to give what the couple seemed to consider a satisfactory answer. Filled with some fresh confidence, he turned to face Victor. What about you, Dorian? The fox was also looking slightly uncomfortable, although Cedric couldn't imagine why. Well, I did fancy this girl from our town a few years ago. Her name was Elsie, and she was the prettiest fox that I'd ever set eyes on. We'd met behind the tower on the town's outskirts every evening and talked about everything under the sun. I really loved her. It felt like I'd never met someone as wonderful as her before. But one day her family moved away, and I was heartbroken. Well, you can't win them all, I suppose. But it took me a long time to get over it. Agnes reached out to hold Victor's hand, as both she and Harold looked touched by the fox's tail. I'm sorry to hear that, my dear. But don't worry, I'm sure that you will meet someone new eventually. There are many folks in this world, after all. Victor wiped what must have been a tear from his eye. Thank you. You're very sweet. And I suppose you're right. Cedric sat there in silence, almost dumbfounded. This last revelation had been an almost gut punch. His hopes and dreams of living with Victor rapidly vanished before him. Of course the fox couldn't love him. Just like most other men, he was attracted to girls. How stupid of him to think it might not have been so in the first place. However, there was one thing that didn't make sense to Cedric. How come Victor of all people had figured out the Coyote's parents thought the two had been lovers? Most people wouldn't even have considered that idea in the first place. There was a chance Victor might be attracted to women and men. Whatever the case, Cedric realized 
he needed to have a proper conversation about this with him. There was no point in carrying on this way, wondering what was true and what wasn't. He needed to be honest with his best friend. V. Um. Dorian, my dear friend, I knew nothing of all of this. I am so sorry to hear things didn't work out for you. It's alright, Alistair. It was a long time ago now. A slight smile seemed to return to Victor's face as he gazed at Cedric with a warm and friendly look. Why don't we drink to love's past, present, and future? The goat raised his pint, and the others did the same. To love! Cedric, Victor, and Agnes all replied. To love! The rest of the evening went by rather swiftly, and it wasn't long before Harold led the two friends into the barn, showing them where that they could sleep for the night. The barn was more spacious than it looked from the outside, tidy and well kept. The tools were all in one corner, a large number of wooden logs were in piles elsewhere, while the hay all about was neatly organized. A few wicker baskets, a wooden ladder, and a bundle of sticks had been left out in the central space, proving the only exception to the overall tidiness. Harold walked in, with Cedric and Victor following. He was carrying some blankets as well as a small lantern which gave off a soft and warm flickering light, bestowing a magical atmosphere upon the barn's interior. As he came to a halt, he put the lantern down on a wooden box. Be careful with these lads. Setting fire to the barn would be fun, but not ideal. The two laughed at this unexpected joke. Don't worry, Harold. Your barn is safe with us. The goat gave them an almost naughty look. I hope so. Sleep well, and don't leave without saying goodbye to the both of us coming morning. Cedric smiled. Of course we won't. And with that, the goat walked out of the barn, leaving the two friends on their own. Cedric sat down on the hay and stretched his legs as Victor walked up to the box with a lantern on it. The cheeky devil, he's left us with a bottle of cider that we hadn't finished. He picked one up and had a drink, while offering Cedric the other. Oh no, I'm fine. Come on, my dear, let's celebrate while we can. This evening has been wonderful. Cedric rolled his eyes, took the bottle and had a sip. Don't you get too drunk, V. Don't worry, Cedric. It takes more than one of these to get this fox drunk. You're right, though they are absolutely lovely people. We've been very lucky. See, I told you that they'd let us in thanks to your looks and demeanor. You were spot on. A moment of silence followed as the two took in their surroundings. They felt a soft breeze come in from the open barn door. Cedric knew that he had to speak with Victor before they eventually fell asleep. It was now or never. He plucked up some of the courage the alcohol had gifted him and spoke up. Uh, hey, Victor. Why don't we sit outside for a while? There's a lovely breeze out there. Of course, why not? A few moments later, the two were sitting outdoors with their backs laid against some haystacks. The starry, unclouded sky was truly a beautiful sight to behold, and they both sat in silence for a few minutes, gazing at it in wonder. Cedric decided to stop procrastinating and began this conversation. He took a deep breath and then spoke. <sighs> Victor, I'm sorry to hear about that story you told earlier. I had no idea that you'd ever met someone you'd fallen for, and to hear it ended badly for you is heartbreaking. It's just one of the many things that we still don't know about each other, I suppose. I realize that we have so much to catch up on. I tend to forget that we're both proper adults now. Indeed, we still have a lot to tell each other. But we have time, don't worry. It's true that we've grown up, but at the same time, it feels like we're still the same kids that we were back then, if you get what I mean. You're right. It's just hearing you talk about that girl, Eliza, made me realize that we have gotten older after all. I wonder what happened to her. I haven't the faintest idea. I don't even know what she looked like. It took a moment for what Victor had said to sink in, but the moment he did, Cedric turned his head suddenly to stare at the fox. What? What do you mean? I have no idea what she looked like. Because I made it all up, silly. 
There was no Elisa in the first place. Cedric sat there with his mouth open, completely speechless. Victor burst out laughing. Why, you rogue! You had me completely fooled! I must have put on a good performance, then. You scoundrel! I could see tears running down your cheek earlier! Thank you, thank you. It took a while for Victor to stop chuckling, after which he spoke again with a more serious tone. The honest truth is that I'm like you, Cedric. I don't think that I've ever met someone that I had proper feelings for. I see. We're both in the same boat, after all. That we are. Victor took another sip from his almost empty bottle. However, there's one more thing that I think you should know, V. Oh? Well, this is difficult to say. The coyote took another deep breath. It took me a long time to figure this out, but I've come to the realization that... The coyote felt his frustration grow. Why was the next bit so difficult to put into words? I'm just... Not attracted to women. So... You like men? Victor broke the silence almost immediately. Cedric looked the other way and gave a nervous reply. Yes, I do. He waited to hear how Victor would react to this, unable to meet his eyes out of shame. However, it was curious how rapidly the fox had picked up on where the conversation was leading once again. Would you fancy that? I never would have imagined so. Just know that this changes nothing about you, Cedric. It's just a matter of preference, and we don't choose to be attracted to who we are. Victor put his hands on his friend's shoulder reassuringly. Cedric felt his nerves rapidly wash off, replaced with a profound feeling of safety and acceptance. As they both hugged, the fox couldn't even begin to imagine how good it felt to hear him speak those words. Victor slowly let go, still sitting close to the coyote. He was now looking the other way, and Cedric started to worry. Was he more upset than he let on? In fact, I suppose this means that I also have a confession to make. Cedric's eyes widened. Was this really happening? I also like men, although I've known so for years. I slept with a few, but nothing more. Cedric was completely overwhelmed at this point. He wanted to ask so many questions, but only managed to quietly say his friend's name. Victor. The fox turned to face him and smiled. Your mouth's open again, Cedric. He put a hand under the coyote's chin and gently pressed his mouth shut. Turns out your parents were right about one thing at least. I guess so. I'm completely blown away. As am I. I really didn't expect you to be like me. Cedric turned to look at the fox with almost teary eyes. He now had the dumbest grin plastered across his face. He still couldn't believe this was actually happening and not just a dream. Victor scratched the back of his head rather nervously. This means that I can tell you something that I thought that I always have to keep to myself. Now, it was the fox's turn to look uncomfortable as he struggled to express his thoughts. Cedric was tremendously curious, not having the faintest idea what his friend was about to say. I find you very cute, Cedric. Cedric did his best to resist the urge to faint or otherwise scream. I... you. Anything resembling words or a sentence had left him at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was that all that he could say to the revelation Victor fancied him of all people? His ears began to twitch as his face got hotter and he nervously tapped his fingers. He did his best to say something else, but to no avail. Victor laughed. I love it when you're all flustered. I've enjoyed your company immensely these last few days. I admire your courage and your honesty. The two sat in silence for a good ten minutes or so, as they both took in what had just happened. The calm sight of the starry sky gave them a sense of tranquility and ease. They both felt as if a heavy burden was finally off of their backs, and they could speak to each other completely honestly 
for the first time since their meeting a few days earlier. Cedric was never the superstitious type, but he couldn't shake off the feeling that all of this was meant to be. It felt like th his life had been leading up to this moment, and all he was meant to do was sit there, feeling completely at peace. After a few more minutes, the fox got up and slowly made his way towards the door again. I think it's time that we both got some sleep now. More journeying awaits us tomorrow. I hope it hasn't been too much for you so far. Cedric picked himself up and followed his friend into the barn. I'm fine. Don't worry. They both undressed and laid themselves down on the blankets the old goat had left them. Victor sat up to blow out the candles inside the lantern. Good night, my dear Cedric. Sleep well. You too. See you in the morning. Victor laid himself down again, gently rustling the hay underneath his blanket. Usually, Cedric would have had trouble switching off his brain after what had happened a short time earlier, but the day's exhaustion had finally caught up with him, and he was fast asleep in no time. The two woke up early the next morning, and after getting dressed and having had a bite to eat, Victor thought that it would be a good idea for them to have a wash in the stream nearby. Once there, Cedric had tried making a joke about both of them getting undressed, thinking it especially amusing after the events the nights prior, but it didn't seem to land well, as Victor remained silent. Cedric had also tried to make some conversation, but this also didn't seem to go very far. He started to worry that something had upset the fox, but he thought that it was best to delay this conversation until they had already left the farmstead. After bathing and drying in the warm sunlight, both were soon ready to set forth on their journey once more. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and judging by the breeze and cheerful sound of the bird songs all around, it was going to be a beautiful day. After knocking at the entrance one last time, the two farmers came to see them off. Harold shook his hands vigorously while Agnes hugged them both. Victor and Cedric were sorry to have to say the goodbye to such lovely people, even after only having met them the evening before. Good luck, boys. If you ever happen to pass this way again, don't hesitate to stop by and say hello. We'd love to have you back here as our guests. Well said, my dear. Have a safe journey, young sirs. Oh, here, take this. Agnes reached for an object inside the house, just behind the entrance. This turned out to be a small basket full of delicious-looking mushrooms. I picked them myself. Have a few of you get peckish along the way. You shouldn't have. Cedric took the basket, closing it and fitting it in the sack with his clothing. Victor then cleared his throat and spoke up. Very well. I say it's time to go. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for everything. The two kept waving as they closed a the small gate behind them and joined the main road, soon losing sight of the old couple in the distance. An hour later, Cedric was already eagerly nibbling on some of the mushrooms. Agnes had gifted them. You sure you don't want any, V? Hmm? The fox turned to face him, seemingly still wrapped up in his own thoughts until that moment. Oh, no thank you. I'm not hungry yet. Just save a few for me and I'll have them later. Cedric was beginning to get worried now. His friend's tone sounded cold and dismissive. Of course. Now was the best moment to ask Victor if anything they'd said last night had upset him. But Cedric was barely able to start thinking about how to word his thoughts when Victor suddenly spoke. Cedric, I... I'm sorry about last night. I really didn't mean to be so forward. I suppose that cider was stronger than I anticipated. So this is what had been bothering him? Cedric thought, as he almost sighed in relief after expecting a much more serious confession. Rather, he was quite amused to see how f flustered the fox seemed to be. No need to apologize, V. I appreciated the comment. And I wasn't able to say this yesterday, but I find you incredibly handsome. Victor stopped in his tracks. You do? Of course I do. You're pulling my leg. Cedric started laughing at his friend's incredulous expression. I swear I'm not. Victor resumed his steady marching pace, seemingly invigorated by his unexpected discovery. In fact, he was now unintentionally walking faster. Cedric, you naughty boy. So you have a thing for handsome and mysterious fox bandits, do you? 
Cedric was still giggling as he engaged with Victor's banter. Most definitely, and you obviously have a thing for broke and problematic rich boys. Indeed, if this is what fate decided that I should like, who am I to argue with that? Well said, well said. So, is this the reason you're coming along with me? It's more of an added bonus. Is this why you asked me to come along with you? I won't confirm or deny that statement. They kept laughing and joking as they journeyed on for the next hour or so. The path had started to grow shadier, and they soon reached a small clearing where they decided that it would be a good idea to rest for a while. The sun's rays shone through the rustling leaves, creating beautiful uneven patterns of light on the damp ground. The two noticed a couple of fallen tree trunks a few feet away and sat themselves down. Cedric offered Victor the basket with the mushrooms again. The fox finally accepted it and tasting a few of them. These are delicious. Told you so. I think we should be nearing a small town now, so keep your ears and eyes open in case anyone comes our way. Will do. The coyote gazed at the large sack his companion had been carrying once more. What was he hiding in it? He decided that he'd try asking again. V, what's in there? What would you tell me? In here? Do you really want to know? Of course I do. The fox hesitated for a moment, then opened the sack, revealing its contents at long last. Sparkling jewels, shiny candlesticks, Silverware, cloth, silk, and satins all greeted Cedric's eye as he took everything in. Wow, where did you get the- Then he noticed these objects were all familiar, too familiar. He recognized those candlesticks and he knew exactly the where they had been sitting before being thrown into that sack. Victor, you stole from my parents' house. Are you completely mad? What if they'd caught you? Hey, relax. I'm here, aren't I? I pulled it off like a true master of the craft. I just thought that it would serve them right for everything they did to us. Cedric crossed his arms, trying to repress his frustration. I don't disagree, but you need to be less reckless. I don't know how to feel about all of this. The fox spoke slowly, as he did his best to think of the right things to say in the situation. Look... I understand your concerns, but risk is a big part of this trade, whether you like it or not. And these objects belong to the scumbags we've left behind us, and we'll never see again. Those scumbags are still my parents, V. That brought the discussion to a grinding halt, as Victor struggled to think of a retort. Then his head sank as he looked the other way. I am sorry, Cedric. I didn't think that it would upset you the way it has. After another short pause, he spoke up again. We're a team now, and I should always consult you before any big decision. I apologize. Cedric sighed as he finally began to calm down. <sighs> it's okay. I suppose I just wasn't ready for this yet. I understand. Fear not. It won't happen again. Cedric gently held Victor's gloved hand. I'll take your word for it. The two shared a short look and smiled, both glad that this argument of sorts was behind them. It might sound nonsensical to most people, but part of Cedric still loved his parents, making it very difficult to accept, much less forgive what his friend had done. However, he thought it best to address these concerns at a later moment, perhaps when he'd reached the larger towns that they were heading to. He let out a gentle sigh as he pushed these uncomfortable feelings to the back of his mind. Victor suddenly arose, almost making Cedric jump. What the? I can hear something. Someone's coming this way. Follow me. The coyote also got up from the log that they'd been sitting on and quickly ran after his friend, sprinting towards some trees nearby. The town the fox had mentioned earlier was in full sight in the landscape beyond them. Then he saw it. A carriage was making its way along the road and heading in their direction. It seemed to be decorated in ornate, meaning this wasn't just anyone. This person had money and lots of it, judging by the sacks that had been 
sturdily fixed to the back of the carriage with some strong rope. Cedric, this is going to be your first robbery. Cedric felt his heart begin to beat faster. This was all so sudden. He began anxiously tapping his right foot as sound faded and his vision blurred all around him. All he could focus on was that small carriage in the distance. Turning to gaze at Victor was what ended up calming his nerves down. The fox hadn't a trace of his friend's worried look, and Cedric knew for a fact that he'd probably been in much worse situations than this one. The bandit knew what he was doing. After gathering his courage, he whispered, All right, V. Tell me what to do, and I'll do my best. A few minutes later, the white polar bear driving the carriage rounded a corner and reached the clearing the two friends had been sitting in earlier. Why was he on his own? This made no sense. His master had told him to head to his new country estate, and that he would catch up with him later that day. Thus, the bear obviously didn't feel safe traveling alone while carrying so much valuable objects. And now, he just entered the forest, which certainly didn't help ease his rising anxiety. All right, Jacob. You've been down this road many times. Everything will be fine. He tried repeating that to himself, but was interrupted as he thought he heard the snapping of some branches. He turned his head in the direction the noise came from, but couldn't see anything unusual. Everything better be fine, for heaven's sake. He rounded another corner, and as he did so, he felt that his heart missed a beat. A few large tree trunks had been strewn across the narrow path, blocking it completely. The horses came to a halt as Jacob panicked, realizing that he'd fallen headfirst into a trap. Oh god, I'm done for! With a sudden rustling of leaves, a figure emerged from the bushes before him. This figure revealed itself to be a bandit clad in dark, ragged robes, wearing an ornate mask and twirling a shiny dagger in his right hand. He confidently walked up to where the bear was seated, obviously having done this many times already. Jacob's mind started racing as he figured there might still be a chance that he could get out of the situation. He rapidly turned around, trying to see the pathway behind him was clear, thinking of how to make his escape. He shivered as he saw another figure appear in that exact spot, wearing a cloth over his muzzle and holding a long knife. Now all hope of making a quick getaway was crushed as the bear stared blankly at the path where the second figure was standing. The first bandit broke the tense silence. All right, chubby, get your arse off that seat. I, I yes. He clumsily jumped off the carriage as the bandit ran up to him, pressing the cold dagger to his throat. Jacob almost squealed. This was worse than any nightmare that he had ever had. Oh, please, please don't kill me. The bandit growled as he pressed his other gloved hand over the bear's mouth. Shut your trap and we'll let you live. Then he turned to his companion who was already cutting the ropes that had been holding the sack at the back of the vehicle. That's it. Nice and easy. Now, what have you got stored inside that beautiful carriage, chubby? S some gold, valuable antiques, and some old documents, and jewelry. The bandit turned to his mate once more. Good boy. Get in there and fetch everything you can. Then take the horses while I tie this fool up. The other seemed to hesitate as he stood motionless. Come on, what are you waiting for? I can't. This feels so wrong. The first bandit's tone grew even more imposing as he obviously began to lose his temper. Now is not the time for self-doubt. Get in there while we still have time. But the other didn't budge and even started taking a few steps back from where they'd been standing. No. What are you doing? Just as everything seemed to begin to go downhill for the two rogues, all three men became aware of a sudden sound of footsteps rapidly approaching. Then some shadows came into view from the pathway behind the corner. Shadows of men with rifles. Guards! We need to leave now! Jacob took advantage of the confusion, digging his elbow into his captor's stomach, forcing him to loosen his grip as the bandit stumbled to the ground. He then made a run for it, passing the others and heading towards the guards who had just rounded the corner and came into view. 
Bandits! Bandits! While Victor picked himself up as quickly as he could, Cedric looked around, trying to find the quickest escape route. The forest seemed to grow thicker to the right, and he noticed that that was the direction the fox was also turning towards. Just as he was about to catch up with Victor, a small object that had fallen to the ground next to him caught his eye. It was a red silk coin purse with some gold leaf decorations. Come on! He picked it up almost without thinking, and then ran to catch up with the fox. Stop right there, or we'll shoot! The guards lifted their rifles, getting ready to fire in their direction. Victor grabbed Cedric's hand. This way! The two ran as fast as they possibly could, so fast that their feet almost didn't touch the ground. Fire! The sound of gunshots rang out behind them as they rushed into the forest without looking back. Cedric was so overwhelmed, as all he could think of at that moment was where he could put his feet to avoid falling over some roots or rocks along the way. They kept running for what seemed like an eternity until they couldn't hear anything except the calm rustling of the leaves above. They finally came to a halt and took a good few minutes to catch their breath. Once they stopped panting, Victor was the first to speak up. What on earth happened back there? Why didn't you go in like I told you to? I am so sorry. I just panicked. Victor groaned as he sat down on the soft grass and answered with a sarcastic tone. A bandit doesn't panic, Cedric. When you steal from someone, part of your brain has to switch off. I told you so. He rested his muzzle in his hands as he grumbled. Fuck it. Better luck next time, I suppose. Wait a moment. Cedric suddenly remembered the purse that he had taken before escaping. I managed to pick this up at the last minute. He handed it to Victor, whose eyes he saw widen as a grin returned to his previously somber face. It's not much, but I'll do better next time, V. I promise. Victor ran his hands through Cedric's hair, ruffling it up affectionately. I'll make a thief out of you yet, rich boy. Cedric chuckled and discovered in the process that doing so is rather difficult when you're mostly out of breath. There is one thing that I don't understand, though. What's that? Where did those guards come from? If it was a coincidence, it was an extremely unlucky one. Good question. I've been wondering that myself. They didn't seem to be following the carriage from what I could tell. I suppose we'll never know. The fox started having a look at the purse's contents as Cedric looked around at the forest. So what now? Heading to that town we could see earlier is obviously not an option anymore. Correct. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I don't know. I need to have a good think about this. Both their ears suddenly shot up as they heard voices in the distance. It sounded like some of the guards were still searching for them. We need to hide again. Get behind those bushes. They scurried to where Victor had been pointing at as they heard what sounded like two guards gradually getting closer. That bear said that they were only two of them. Aye, I saw two, but there might have been more hiding. The guards came into view as the two friends saw them searching some of the bushes. Luckily, they seemed to be heading away from where the bandits were crouched. You think that might be the whole gang of them? I wouldn't exclude it. Remember what the captain told us the other day. It would seem like a group of bandits had returned to these woods. They probably set up camps somewhere deep within it. Oh yes, that would make sense. These two have probably just joined them. Victor turned to Cedric and whispered. That's it. I know what to do. Follow me. They slowly crept out of the bushes as the guards' voices faded away. I think I know who they were talking about. You do? If these are the bandits that I think they are, we're safe. Do they know you? The fox smiled, likely recalling some amusing past events. Oh, we're old friends. He quickened his pace, telling Cedric that he hoped to get to these bandits' camp before dusk. Do you have any idea where this hideout is? Absolutely none. But if it is them, I know exactly where to look. Cedric was relieved that things seemed to be going their way again, and felt less tired than he would have otherwise, now that he knew they were finally headed somewhere safe.
The sun was beginning to set and everything was turning a deep orange once more, the shady forest growing even darker as time went by. Back in the clearing where Cedric's first robbery had taken place a few hours earlier, everything had been left scattered on the ground, the guards having been told to leave the various sacks and precious objects as they were until further notice. A couple of them patrolled a path nearby, just to make sure all was safe. As the evening crept in, only three travelers on their way to the town had passed that way, inquiring as to what had happened, otherwise all had been peaceful. The two guards turned their heads as they heard the sound of someone on horseback approaching. This person greeted them and, as they dismounted from their steed, told them that they'd been sent by the captain to have a look at the crime scene. The guards saluted them and explained everything that had been left exactly as it was when the attack occurred. The newcomer didn't bother to thank the two and headed straight for the carriage. After looking at the various objects, they'd open one of the doors, obviously searching for something specific, but nothing inside seemed to satisfy them either. In a burst of rage, they kicked the carriage, toppling it over in the process. The guards looked at each other, confused, also quite amused by the odd spectacle they were witnessing. The newcomer grunted and was about to leave when a small object on the ground caught their eye. They rapidly knelt down to pick up what turned out to be a small white chess piece. Ah, at long last, I have been looking for this. Lysander felt a wave of satisfaction hit him as he gazed intently at this latest catch. Innumerable thoughts raced across his mind. And so I have finally found you, Cedric, you fool. It turns out this piece you stole has led me straight to you. I hope your lowlife outing has been enjoyable so far, because I am going to make sure that it will not last much longer. He tightened his grip around the small white knight, almost as if he was trying to squeeze the life out of it. And I promise you that it will end with both of you where you truly belong, you living the life you were meant for in my arms and that baseborn fox's head laid upon that chopping block. To be continued. Yikes. Yay, an autosave. Hello, and thank you for reading the second build for Project New Moon's A Fall From Grace. This novel is written by, composed by, and illustrated by project developer Alex. With Grayson as main coder, music programmer, and story designer. This visual novel's entire plot, start to finish, was conceived on two voice calls between Grayson and myself back in around March of 2022. We've had so much fun designing a story that utilizes Alex's gorgeous way of setting places and characters. And Gray's ability to yes and an entire visual novel plot over only two voice calls. This has been a passion project that I have been so excited to be a part of and continue to be excited for the continuation of. A Fall from Grace represents more than just a visual novel. It's also the story of how Alex and I became best friends. Did you guys, you know, become bandits? Ever since the first message of, hey, I love your art on Twitter. Then following this, the idea of A Fall from Grace came about very quickly after Grayson offered me a place on the Project New Moon team. A special thanks also to MASH, the chief editor, proofreader, and storyline aide for the project. Without the help of MASH, we would not be able to release this build to you now. And thank you to our relief coder, Kamek, for his hard work in salvaging Grayson's coding work into a visual novel that works from start to finish. Special thanks to Marcy of Eden's Reach for helping with certain elements of the coding. And also a massive thank you to everyone in Project New Moon's Discord server and our amazing moderators, Okami, Butter, Gary, and Tiny. I hope you enjoyed the OST written by Alex. No expenses were spared when Alex suggested a soundtrack based on English folk songs. Though I did sneak one track into this build for the Soldier's March just based on a piece of music that Alex and I both adore. If you did enjoy this visual novel, be sure to follow us both on Twitter using the icons on the main menu or the links down in the description, which I will place there. <laughs> we also have a link to our Discord server here too. Please join if you enjoyed this visual novel. We would love to see you in our Discord community. Also consider following Project New Moon on itch.io as well. We also have a link on the main menu to our Patreon. 
If you would like early access to both A Fall from Grace as well as our flagship visual novel, Lost in the Memories, please consider a pledge there. We also post early access scripts, concept art, and character art on the Patreon too. So if you like what we're doing and want bonus content and early access, it's all there. Thank you all. Hope you enjoyed Project New Moons. A Fall from Grace. So, that was part two of, you know, A Fall from Grace. Mm. And you can see Eden's Reach right here in One Last Night. Ah, so, the guy's getting in a little pickle because uh, Lysander is following them and, you know, is not leaving well enough alone because I guess he doesn't like that someone else is going to sleep with the guy that he apparently had a thing for but wouldn't say anything about. He could have just come out and said, hey, dude, I like you, coyote boy. Come on, be my boyfriend. Even though it wouldn't be socially acceptable and even though I wouldn't be able to call you my boyfriend and I'd probably treat you very badly. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. It's also kind of nice that they express their mutual admiration for each other. <laughs> um, by which I mean Victor and Cedric. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of obvious that Cedric wasn't going to be able to, you know, jump into the whole bandit lifestyle just like out of the gate. So to expect him to be able to do it like immediately was a little presumptuous, you know, uh, Victor's, you know, on Victor. But yeah. Anywho, what do you guys think is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Write down in the comments. And thank you all for watching slash listening. And I pretty much already went over everything that I usually go over, where if you would like to, you know, support the project, they do have a Patreon, which will be linked down in the description. I will also be linking down the two Twitter accounts that were mentioned previously, right? Like a few minutes ago or seconds ago for the two creators, which should have direct links. Or I don't know if there is an actual one. No, not one last night. Um, uh, a Fall From Grace Twitter page. But I will link all that down in the description. And remember, you don't even have to have Twitter in order to access it. it you know, to see like the first few tweets. And usually there's one pin that has a direct link to the HIO page. Because unless you have an account on HIO, you won't be able to immediately find the visual novels, especially furry visual novels, for good reason. But yeah. And if you can't access Twitter, then... Oh well. <laughs> I mean, there the Patreon should probably have a link. Like, you know, just click on Patreon. You don't, you know, just look through their, the free part and, you know, see if there's a link to, you know, something. To the Discord, something, I don't know. Anywho, so yeah, you know, write down, comment. And I guess that's it for now. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.